All right, now's a good time, a good a time as any. Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? Happy Black History Month. Uh, thank you for joining us at the first ever uh, 50C Forum on Black Health, the virtual version. My name is Jason Millison. I am the Director of Communications for the DC Department of Parks and Recreation, and I am also the lead for the 50C3 initiative, which is Mayor Muriel Bowser's health and wellness campaign designed specifically for 2021 to bring simplified health and wellness to you residents of DC during these complicated times. So the reason we put together this forum on black health, obviously during Black History Month is to really take a step back amid the pandemic and address all of the different issues that are the most pressing for the black community. So I am very happy to be joined um, by a team of local health experts, leaders in the healthcare space, and also in the social emotional education space to tackle some of these issues, give you guys some strategies, some tips, and just have a general open discussion about things you can do to put you and your family out of harm's way when it comes to the biggest risks to the Black community. So uh, I'd like to first thank Aetna for this uh, great opportunity. Aetna is the official partner of the 50C3 initiative. And in doing so, I would like to welcome Marcus Duckworth, Vice President of client management for Aetna's public and labor sector to take over for us and say a few words to get us started. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much, Jason. And good evening to all of you who've taken the time to join us and, and engage in this very important discussion and, and dialogue. As Jason mentioned, I'm part of Aetna's local dedicated public sector and labor team here in DC. And as a health company, um, we certainly understand uh, the importance of not only openly talking about the health issues facing the Black community, but also talking about what all of us can do to address these challenges head on. Uh, we'd also like to take some time to thank uh, D.C. government for their continued partnership in all things health and wellness, along with the Department of Parks and Recreation and the FIT D.C. 3 team and Sky Schools as well. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this evening's panel, Dr. William Blake, Director of Social Emotional Learning at DC Public Schools. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be here on this, on this evening. Um, thank everyone for signing on in this late hour. I know there's a lot going on in people's personal and professional lives, but we are gonna have a very strategic and intentional conversation tonight with some esteemed panelists around the state of health in the Black community. At this time, I am now going to just share a short bio of the amazing panelists that we have um, that we have on this evening. The first person that I would definitely like to highlight is Dr. Nina Miles Everett. She serves as the Chief Medical Officer for Aetna Better Health of Maryland. Her focus lies in social determinants of health, prevention, and diabetes care. And today, she will be talking about heart health and diabetes. The next esteemed panelist that we have is Dr. Barbara Berzon. She serves as the director of DC Department of Behavioral Health. Her focus lies in the integration of mental health and addiction services, as well as addressing issues of health disparities in healthcare. Today, she will be talking about behavioral health resources for DC residents. We also have Dr. Rana, who serves as the professor of pediatrics at Howard University. His focus lies in overcoming stigma and working towards social justice in healthcare. Today, he will be talking about HIV and sickle cell disease. And lastly, we have Mr. Clark Weatherspoon, who joins us today from the West Coast and serves as the head of San Francisco Friends School and Sky Schools instructor. Sky Schools have been offering meditation, breathing, and healing conversation sessions to the DC community through fitdc.com. Mr. Weatherspoon focuses as an educator in diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And today, 
he will be talking about meditation and mindfulness. To get us started today, Mr. Weatherspoon will lead us through a collective breath practice before we begin our discussion. So now we invite you all in the space to clear your hearts, to clear your minds, and we are going to reset as we prepare for this very pivotal conversation around health, specifically the state of Black health in the Black communities. Mr. Weatherspoon? Thank you, Dr. Blake. It's an honor to join you all from California. Um, I'd like to report that it was 65 degrees today, it's sunny. Um, Want to share that sunshine with you uh, this evening. It's a it's a great honor to be connected to DC, which is which is not just the political capital, but the black capital. I would argue of of the United States. And so, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I'd like everybody to sit comfortably. I'm just going to take a few moments and really prepare to be present, to hear some wisdom from members of the community. So I'd like you to sit comfortably. If you have anything in your hands, if you could put it down and relax into your chair. We'll take a deep breath in through the nose and we'll breathe out through our mouth. <sighs> so much happened today. So much happened yesterday. So much happened the day before. And we're gonna take a deep breath in through the nose. And we're gonna breathe out through the mouth. <sighs> we're just gonna let it go. One more time, we're gonna take a deep breath in through the nose. And as we breathe out through the mouth, we're gonna let the eyes close. <sighs> and keep breathing through your nose. Feel your body sink into the chair or the couch. Maybe you're even in a car on the way home and someone is playing this on their phone. Wherever you're situated, let the furniture, let the earth, whatever it is, let it support you. Nice deep breath in through the nose. And breathe out through your nose. And just bring your awareness to your feet. If you have shoes on, allow your toes to relax in your shoes. If you're barefooted, feel the connection to the floor. Become aware of your ankles and calves. Become aware of your knees. Become aware of your thighs and your hips. And take a deep breath in once again through the nose and breathe out. Bring your attention to your abdomen, your stomach. To your chest and your shoulders. Become aware of your right arm and your right palm. Your left arm and your left palm. Become aware of your throat and neck. Become 
become aware of your face. And as you do so, whether it's real or fake, just put a soft, gentle smile on your face. Become aware of your ears and the top of your head. Take a deep breath in through the nose and breathe out through your nose. Be aware of your whole body. And take another deep breath in through the nose with a soft smile on the face, whether it's real or fake. And breathe out. One more deep breath in. And breathe out. You can wiggle your fingers and toes. Rub the hands together. Massage the face a little bit. And one more deep breath in through the nose. And breathe out. Let the shoulders relax. And when you're ready, slowly and gradually open your eyes. As I said, it's a joy to be here with all of you. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to get us started, Dr. Blake, and I want to turn it back to you. Wow, wow, wow. Mr. Weatherspoon, thank you. Um, I hope that has allowed everyone to center into the space and to bring clear hearts and minds to this amazing conversation that we're going to explore tonight. I would like to start off with some context. February, 2020 changed the trajectory and the landscape of our world. We were hit with COVID-19. And at that moment, the conversation around health has sparked in communities across our countries. But most importantly, we have been very focused on the state of health, primarily in our African-American communities, in our communities of color, and also in our communities where the most marginalized populations reside. Today, our panel of experts, we are going to dig in to some real in-depth questions that will bring out responses that will allow us to heal our Black community, during this time that we are facing right now. We are going to explore health. We are going to explore heart health. We are going to explore mental health. And we're just going to explore the different type of health fields that can help us sustain our our joy of living in in our great nation. So as Mr. Weatherspoon just kicked us off with that phenomenal mindfulness exercise, I would like to pose the first question to him. Mr. Weatherspoon, as we really talk about mental health and mindfulness, what is important for the black community to understand about mental health? Yeah, um, for me, I think attending to mental health is a daily practice, first and foremost. And it requires a holistic understanding of what health means, right? So engaging with medical doctors, engaging 
with uh, people that have invested their time in understanding psychology, psychotherapy, all those things are very important. Also understanding the need for physical fitness, right? So whether it's walking around the block, paying attention to your diet, spending time in silence, it's really, really important. Spending time in nature, spending time reflecting, but also observing, right? So for me, as, a, as an instructor of meditation, of health and wellness, taking time to just observe feelings and recognize that feelings are changing and transforming, recognizing that our body is changing and transforming throughout our entire existence. I'll say something, you know, the body regenerates itself constantly, right? The blood changes, the organs change, the bones change. Having some understanding of this phenomenon is very important on a simple level and relying on the wisdom, I would say of masters, right? So I have the opportunity to be on this panel with all of these medical doctors. These people are masters recognizing that there is deep medical knowledge that we need, but also deep spiritual philosophical knowledge that needs to be partnered with this knowledge so that we can understand holistically people of all genders, all sexualities, all social classes, all economic backgrounds need to have a holistic understanding and approach to health. The courses that we teach through Sky Schools embrace the subtle yet profound impacts of meditation, breathing, gentle body movement, observation and silence, and recognize that those are critical complements to medical professions and professionals that can help us nurture and maintain the body. Thank you for that. Um, that was a great introduction to the, the tone of our conversation um, for this evening. Due to COVID-19, uh, we have really been focusing on the underlying conditions that many of us um, possess because due to our underlying conditions, you might be more exposed to the virus. One of the underlying conditions that have been um, talked about for years in Asia in the Black community is um, high blood pressure. So Dr. Miles Everett, can you share some light on how do I know that I have high blood pressure and what are some ways to reduce blood pressure? So very simply, High blood pressure occurs when the force of your blood pushing against the walls of your blood pressure is too high, of your blood vessels is too high. So it increases your risk of heart disease and stroke, and yet there is no way of knowing what it is unless you have it checked by a health professional, um, by a blood pressure cuff. And that could be by a health professional, or you can measure it at home. They have a lot of blood pressure cuffs at supermarkets and drugstores. And that'll do, but they're not always accurate because they're not always handled with care. So really it's important to know your number and there is no way to know it unless you get a check. So Mr. Witherspoon talked about health professionals and it's especially important that communities of color find health professionals who they trust. Because step one is you have to have that trust before you go to the doctor and again, it's only when you go to get your blood pressure checked that you know whether it's high or not. So that's the first thing. In terms of ways to lower your blood pressure, I mean, Mr. Witherspoon really gave my whole talk <laughs> because medicine is a small piece of it, but it is important to say that if you need medicine, you have to take it and you have to take it as prescribed. So if your medicine is given, should be given once a day, that means you have to take it once a day because after 24 hours, it's gone for your bloodstream. So you can take it every day for five years. If you miss a day, then you're unprotected. So if you need medicine, take it. But what are some non-medical things that you can do? The big thing is watching your weight. People who are obese have higher rates of high, high blood pressure, which again, is another reason why it impacts communities of color because we tend to carry weight. The next thing is to watch your diet. And that's a big one. The, the obvious one is lower your salt intake. Many people, they salt their food before they even take it. 
And today's processed food contains way too much sodium in it. So by adding salt at the table, you are actually making it worse. But also pouring it in the pot when you're cooking doesn't make it any better. So it's best to start with unprocessed food, um, to, load your to load your diet with fruits and vegetables, a diet low in saturated fats and low in trans fats, whole grains, low fat dairy. Those are the kinds of things that you need to do. The other thing is exercise. Again, Mr. Witherspoon hit the nail on the head. Being physically active is an important part of maintaining your weight and helping lower your blood pressure. And people think that you have to put on your sweatsuit and run all the time. There are many ways you can exercise, even starting with small things like parking a little further or not even driving, walk. Walk where you're going, take the stairs when you're in different buildings. The more you know how to do and incorporate it into your regular life, the better. The idea is to pick something that you like. If you don't like running, don't run. There's plenty of exercises for free on YouTube. You don't need an expensive gym membership. Just make sure that you get active and move. Again, lower your stress. When you lower your stress, your blood pressure comes down. And then things like avoiding cigarettes, um, Smoking is a bad thing. It raises your blood pressure. So those are things that you can control. So things like family history, your race, um, your increasing age, your gender, those are things that you can impact. So you definitely want to make sure that you impact the things that you can. Awesome. Thank you for that. Staying on the topic of underlying uh, conditions, I would like to invite sure. Rana to the, um, to the floor. Dr. Varna, can you tell us about your research and findings with HIV and sickle cell disease and why we see these conditions affecting the African-American community? I believe you're on mute, Dr. Reina. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. Well, uh, let me just tell a little bit about myself. I've been at Harvard for 40 years. Uh, I trained in Brooklyn. I was born in Pakistan and I came to Brooklyn and that's where I saw my first child with sickle cell disease. I went to Rochester to get training in blood diseases. And once I finished, uh, I drove in with my U-Haul and Buick Skylark to Harvard University and I've been there ever since. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, the two diseases I've dealt with the most uh, one that I was trained for, and that sickle cell disease, it's a genetic disease. I mean, uh, you cannot catch it from somebody, you have to inherit it. And generally it means you have to inherit it from both parents. So among African-Americans, uh, uh, in, for example, living in Washington, DC, uh, about 7% of African-American population has trait for sickle cell disease. So their children are at risk of having sickle cell disease. So knowing their status as related to trait, whether or not they have sickle trait, or another one like hemoglobin C or thalassemia trait, which would put them at risk of having a child with sickle cell disease, that's an important thing. Uh, sickle cell disease uh, is a progressive uh, and lifelong disease, which causes damage to all organs. Uh, and of course, in addition, sickle cell disease is identified by repeated pain crisis. And that pain, those pain crises often take uh, these poor individuals to emergency rooms and to doctors seeking relief for pain. And that leads to a lot of stigma related to uh, drug seeking behavior and so on and so forth. So poor people with sickle cell disease uh, get stigmatized. Among many communities, uh, there is also stigma of a genetic disease uh, that here is our family uh, who, who is tainted in somehow, who is less than others uh, because of having uh, sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease within their family. So people are afraid to share the diagnosis. I know many African countries, they are very afraid of telling anybody that their child has sickle cell disease. I started taking care of HIV about 
35 years ago when I saw my first child with uh, HIV who was from a Caribbean island. And since then I've been involved in research for HIV, pretty much tried and, and in clinical trials, almost every drug that is available now in the market for children uh, with HIV and for prevention of transmission of HIV from mother to child. So we have come a long way, uh, but one place where we are not only lagging behind, but we have not changed at all is, is the area of stigma that people, uh, because of their ignorance, uh, because of uh, really uh, unwillingness to find out information or absorb or change their behavior, uh, they look down on people with HIV, uh, which devalues those people, take their human rights away. Uh, and that makes it very, very difficult for them to share their diagnosis, even with the closed loved one. When they cannot share the diagnosis, uh, that leads to all the work that they put in into hiding their diagnosis, uh, number one and then passing on the virus to other people because they were unable to uh, disclose it to their partners. Uh, and, and certainly it can be passed on uh, to the children from mother to child. So about 20 years ago, I became very aware as I, uh, these children who were born with HIV, uh, they were like my own children, many of them, and they still are my children. Many of their parents died and they, they, they trusted us and loved us like their own, own, own uh, parents. Uh, and I became so aware of their pain uh, uh, as they dealt with the rest of the world uh, at school, with their friends, with their loved ones, as they formed relationship, love relationship. Uh, it broke my heart, you know, each time. Uh, they, they, so there wasn't a domain, there wasn't a facet of their life that did not get tainted with stigma and, uh, and, and that made them feel so small wanting to really bury themselves. You know, there are diseases like breast cancer or leukemia today. You get diagnosed with breast cancer, you get diagnosed with leukemia, you become a hero. You put an ad on on Facebook and you start collecting money uh, and, and nothing, you know, nothing bad about those illnesses. Uh, other than um, to say that HIV and sickle cell disease are diseases very much like those diseases which, which really damage the whole body and in some way can be worse than uh, malignancies. Uh, and stigma associated with these illnesses is what ends up killing these people, especially with HIV. When people are unable to seek medical care when they would not take medication because who would find out uh, they stop taking their medication, they stop going to doctor and uh, they end up dying when they can have a normal life taking their medication. So I'll take a breath here, Dr. Blake. <laughs> thank, no, <laughs> thank you for that context and thank you for also um, sharing your expertise around how to disrupt the stigma. Uh, we have to communicate and we have to definitely engage our healthcare professionals if we believe that uh, we have um, an illness or ailment um, going on within our body. So, so thank you for that. For those of us in the DC area, over this past year, we have become accustomed to the press conferences held by our esteemed mayor, Mayor M Muriel Bowser. And she always has someone along with her who is the, um, the spokesperson for our DC Health Department, Dr. Nesbitt. We have someone that works for the Department of um, Behavioral Health and we would like to invite Dr. Bezron to tell us a little bit about the DC Department of Behavioral Health and what all that you all do. Thank you, Dr. Blake. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. And, and I would really like to start by really emphasizing something that was said earlier. And that is that mental health is an integral part of overall health. We cannot ignore mental health. 
So, uh, some, so, so I want to really spend a little bit of time talking to you about some of the services and supports that we have available at, that I think are just critically important, particularly during uh, this pandemic. As so was stated earlier, the Department of Behavioral Health is the district's public behavioral health system. We really work to uh, prevent the onset of both mental health and substance use uh, disorders. This pandemic has affected all of us emotionally and mentally in some, some way. If there's anyone who's listening who says it hasn't, let's rethink that. It has impacted every single one of us. Studies show that the pandemic is affecting our mental and emotional well being as people are feeling depressed, they're feeling anxious, they are suffering loss and grief as a result of experiencing the death of a loved one. And I want to talk a little bit about the difference between what we're all experiencing right now and what it is to have a mental illness. And I think we need to make that demarcation. Um, right now, what we are experiencing is not the same as an ongoing chronic mental illness that requires ongoing treatment and perhaps psychotropic medications. What this is, is we really need to promote mental wellness at this point. The Department of Behavioral Health is promoting a mental wellness through our social media, through a series of virtual meetings like this one here today. And also we're focusing on self-care strategies like the one uh, that we all experienced at the beginning of today's event. And we need to really focus on how we build resiliency to help us cope with the current environmental conditions. Simple practices like we uh, all experienced before in terms of breathing exercises, simple things like managing your schedule, having a routine and staying in contact with others is particularly important at this time. We need to reduce isolation, stay connected uh, so that we can deal with our stress and anxiety. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think most of you are aware of is we have a wide and broad range uh, of services. However, within the 10 minutes that have been allotted to me, uh, I uh, will uh, speak about some particular things that I think might be important, particularly as we address, address uh, the pandemic. Number one, I think that here again, we all have to be willing to take care and mind our mental health. There's a lot of stigma in the Black community about mental health, about not wanting to be have a mental illness. Right now, we all need that support. So uh, please know that. We've established a 24 seven uh, mental health hotline at 1-888-793-4357. A 1-887-WE uh, HELP uh, is the acronym. And this is uh, specifically to address some of the stress and distress of all the members of our community who are experiencing anxiety, grief, and loss related to COVID-19. Yeah, you can talk about self-care strategies and coping mechanisms with a clinician. And for most of us, that's sufficient to help us feel better and to get back on track. Anyone within the district can call the hotline, reach a licensed clinician any time of the day or night that they want to, to talk about how they are feeling. You don't have to sign up, you don't have to enroll or even make an appointment. You can call day or night for up to three individual counseling sessions at no cost. If you need extra support, then we will make sure that you get connected to ongoing services. I'd also like you to know that we have a wide range of provider partners in the community located in all eight wards. 
and they have been working throughout the pandemic providing both virtual sessions, both virtually as well as on site. And I'm really proud of the work uh, that they have been able uh, to do. The other thing that we have focused on uh, during the pandemic is really uh, understanding that uh, the pandemic has presented a unique set of challenges for families and children. Parents are struggling to balance work, to balance childcare, self-care, and to run a household. Our new parent support program includes 24 seven access to a clinician for immediate help to manage these stressors and weekly online support groups for parents that give them time to share their experiences, provide mutual support and build resiliency. And I can't overestimate make the importance of building and sharing with others and building that mutual support network. These sessions are recorded and placed on our website in a resource library along with other resources and videos and provide tools for parents on self-care, on su uh, support for distance learning and social emotional development activities uh, for uh, children. So we really ask you to please uh, visit our website at www.dbh.dc.gov and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at dbhrecoversdc for the information on how to join our Wellness Wednesday sessions, our online parent sessions, uh, support groups, which are offered at from 5.30 to 6.30 every Wednesday. And I want you to know that we really, in fact, uh, do offer those in both English as well as in Spanish. So uh, we try to make that as accessible uh, for all. Uh, the other thing that I really wanna spend one moment on, and that is, to really talk about another population that has been severely impacted by the pandemic. And those are individuals who are battling with opioid addiction. Social distancing, quarantining and isolation uh, for these individuals makes the, it, it especially challenging when you're trying to either stay in recovery uh, or to move into recovery. And social connectedness uh, and social connections are really essential uh, as, and we know that social isolation is a known factor and known trigger for relapse. To support this population, the district has made investments in outreach teams or, which are working out in the neighborhoods, recovery housing, prevention centers, and mobile treatment services to promote treatment and recovery across all eight wards. There's another thing that we can all do in an effort to reduce the rate of fatal overdoses, which we know are going through the roof here within the District of Columbia. And that is that pull out your cell phone right now and text live long DC to 888 -111 and you will get some information. Anyone in the district who texts uh, that uh, can receive a map of locations to get free naloxone, the life-saving revival drug, and where it is near them without a prescription or the identification. And I think that this is really important. You never know when you're gonna need it. We all should have it at all times. I carry it with me. And we encourage everyone who is listening to get this rapid reversal drug uh, in case somebody overdoses. It could be a loved one, it could be a neighbor, we don't know uh, who it might be. Uh, we also want you to know is that we have people who are out there in the community right now. Our community uh, response team is working 24-7. Uh, they are clinicians and people with lived experience who are there to help anyone who they uh, encounter. I am really grateful for having the opportunity to spend a moment with you to share uh, some of the resources that we have uh, through the Department of Behavioral Health that can help you build resiliency and also 
to maintain your recovery and if you do have mental health or substance use uh, uh, issues. Please remember to take care of yourself. Self-care is extremely important at this time. Thank you for, re uh, for really listening. And remember, DBH is here for you. You can reach us here again at any time. I can't say this number enough. At 1-888-7-WE-HELP or 1-888-793-4357. Thank you so very much for listening and thank you uh, for this opportunity. And uh, also uh, uh, just know that at this time, we are also uh, working very, very hard with other members of the team to focus on some of the trauma and some of the issues around gun violence that also is happening within our neighborhood and providing those individuals with the trauma support they need. So uh, thanks one again. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you for that very detailed and descriptive um, overview of the Department of Behavioral Health. I must say that I have witnessed the, um, the interaction and engagement with DBH as a employee of, the, uh, of DCPS, District of Columbia Public School Systems, where you all provide a wealth of <laughs> to our students that is truly, truly appreciative. Mm -hmm. Staying on the topic of mental health, mm -hmm. as I was preparing for uh, this moderation, I actually conducted some research around the stigma of mental health in the mm -hmm. Black community. And upon my research, I discovered um, the following. According to the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence, white women are more likely to get to receive or to pursue mental health resources more than any other gender or ethnicity um, mm -hmm. in our nation. Mm -hmm. Secondly, after a review of 10 urban neighborhoods, and they define urban as having a populace of over 90% of the residents being African-American, there was a lack of mental health resources in those communities as compared to our affluent white communities who have a populace of over 80% of, of, of our white counterparts residing in those areas. With that research, I would like to kick it back to Mr. Weatherspoon. What are some of the mental health disparities that we see in society facing the black community, especially after the presence of COVID? I'm gonna let Dr. Uh, Bazaron jump in. Were you about to say something else? No, after you. Oh, okay. Um, so, one of the things that COVID has done is it's highlighted existing disparities, right? And it's made resources which people were not necessarily using all the more valuable and harder to find, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, everything from, from knowing who a good therapist is, right? Um, knowing why one might go to a therapist, engaging the stigma, you know, so for instance, for me, I mean, I'm not gonna rely actually on research here, but I think one of the things that's really important as a black man is that for me, I, I was socialized to not seek help in a lot of areas, right? And that's from men of all races, but also in my interactions with other black men, you're taught to not show vulnerability. You're not, you're not supposed to admit when you're having feelings. Um, one of the things that I experienced when I, when I started to learn meditation was I started crying again. It's an interesting, an interesting um, thing to say. I hadn't actually cried for a period of six years. I want you to think about that for a second. I went through six years of my life without crying. That's through, you know, graduating from college, meeting nieces and nephews, you know, having great successes and great tragedies but being so out of touch with my emotions and pushing my emotions down so much, I didn't even have the capacity to cry. And part of that was through socializing and being taught that I had to suppress my feelings, right? So 
one of the things that's so important in the black community, particularly, I mean, I would argue for black men is recognizing when we need help and recognizing that seeking support for mental health. And that can be everything from dealing with anger, dealing with fear. Um, one of the things that I experienced, you know, I've had a very privileged life. I have to say that I've lived in wonderful places and had a great education. I've also experienced a lot of fear from experiencing violence, right? So in particular, experiencing violence from the police. Um, everywhere that I've ever gone in the United States, that's been a concern that I've had. That's been very stressful for me. Understanding that that's actually a reasonable fear that produces stress is something that a lot of people don't think about, right? So one big thing that we have to begin to work on first and foremost, I think, is acknowledging that we all experience fear. The second thing is recognizing that our society encourages us not to acknowledge that fear and it makes it difficult to seek support. It's also really important in our social connections with friends to make sure that those connections go beyond the surface. So for instance, if you have a group of friends and you're just watching sports making sure that at some point you're muting it and asking people how they're doing. Right. Making sure that, that when you have a text conversation, you're able to say to your friend, hey, I'm having a hard time. Can you reach out to me? Mm -hmm. All of these very, very, very simple things, even taking a socially distant walk during the pandemic, saying to your neighbor, hey, listen, let's double mask. Let's put a face shield on and just take a walk with me mm -hmm. around the block. All of these things are so critical because they're the... They're the beginning of creating trusting relationships. Dr. Uh, Dr. Miles Everett talked about this, this notion of finding a healthcare worker and a healthcare provider that can support you. And also finding a meditation class, a yoga class, a Tai Chi class, whatever it is, that's taught by someone who you can connect with, trust, and share concerns with. I'll just say this, for me, as I started this journey of learning about meditation and mindfulness, I sought out other black people who were doing these things. And I asked about their experiences. I continue to do that. That's really important to me. I also have learned more skills in terms of reaching out to people from different communities, asking them about their background, their experiences, the stresses that they're feeling and recognizing as other people have spoken about this notion that stigma really holds us back, right? So last thing I'll say, as we consider creating a practice, recognizing that we all have things we can do in our homes, whether it's five minutes of stretching, 10 minutes of breathing, three push-ups a day, one pull-up a day, walking up and down our stairs instead of taking the elevator. If we begin to do those things on a regular basis, it can actually allow other people to see us do them and it will allow them to reach out to us. I think there was, a, there was a question in the chat about this notion of building a network. The more that we practice these things, it signals to others that maintenance of these things is important to us. It encourages them to build up the confidence to do them themselves. And it creates stronger networks of mutual care and support, which is really critical as we think about the pandemic because we don't have the same levels of autonomous movement and like, general wandering that we had in the past. And so it, it means we have to be far more attentive to mutual support, consistent practice of, of um, healthy habits in a manageable way, right? So not assuming that we're gonna change our lives in one day, but thinking about taking small steps every day to build out more uh, resilient practices and empowerment strategies that are gonna help us understand what mental wealth means and what mental health means and how that's different from entertainment, right? When we think about the activities we used to do prior to the pandemic, I think a lot of us confused health and wealth with entertainment. And now we have to be a little more attentive and diligent around how we develop health and wealth, even though it might not be as entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add, uh, somebody uh, asked about um, what do we need to do to reduce isolation? And what is that? And, you know, we reduce isolation and what do we do? And I think that um, what you were saying is so true. I mean, it's about building relationships and staying connected. 
if it's calling several people on the phone every day to check in with them so you build that relationship if it is taking a social distanced walk with someone um, I know a, a number of people are doing that in their backyard where they are, are communicating with one another, but still maintaining distance. That's very important. Uh, th th but those little connections and building those relationships among and between people is, is, uh, is, is extremely important. You got to make sure you maintain those friendships and those relationships so that you have somebody that where you can say, hey, look, this is a bad day for me. I'm really stressed out. You know, you have some support and so forth. The other thing that I do want to share is I wanted, wanted to um, uh, also talk about the impact of, uh, of, of stigma and shame in the Black community. Um, it has been a, a cultural uh, issue around, can I go and get mental health care? Am I crazy if I do that? I don't want to be that. And, and does it mean I am weak? And the issue is, it is a part of health. And all of us do need to reach out and to take care of our mental well-being. And so we have to kind of bust through the stigma. I think that that's important. And also remember that right now, the other thing is the, the, the trauma that's being felt in our community and here in the district, particularly with the uptick in gun violence and understanding that a lot of young folks and neighborhoods and family members are really being impacted by that. And so they need supports so that they can build resilience and that that trauma, that untreated trauma can be treated now rather than later when it becomes more serious. So um, I, I'm really glad that we're having the mental health discussion because it is critical. It is not an add on to health, it is health. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. A great, great discussion, great discussion. Um, now I'm going to bring it back to uh, Dr. Miles Everett. According to the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, they say in order to identify if you have an underlying condition, it is very important to know your family history. So for those of us that uh, are aware of our family history, and if several of my relatives have diabetes, does that mean I have it too? You, you are mute, Dr. Miles Everett. There you go. Oh. Sorry about that. All right. Um, first thing I actually wanted to do is I wanted to shout out Dr. Rana because I am a proud graduate of Howard University College of Medicine um, a million years ago. Um, second, just to answer your question about um, family history and diabetes. And certainly diabetes like high blood pressure definitely has a genetic link. Um, there are genes that pass on, that predispose one to, be, to um, developing either one. However, more often than not, it's not the genes alone that's inherited, it's the lifestyle that we inherited. So if you grow up in a household where rich and high caloric meals with lots of processed food were the norm, then you too will cook and eat and purchase the same kinds of foods and feed it to your partner and your family. If you grew up in a home where no one exercised, then you yourself are not gonna exercise. Versus if you grew up in a home where people were active, they were on sports team, then that becomes important to you. So again, the unhealthy habits that we inherit are really what predispose us to different diseases. So unhealthy eating habits and lack of exercise lead to obesity. So obesity creates insulin resistance. Insulin resistance leads to prediabetes and prediabetes progresses to diabetes. So it's important to recognize that it's not inevitable, but it will be unless you take steps to do the kinds of things that you heard people talking about here today. Um, 
And I just want us to say something because there's not a whole lot talked about about this condition called prediabetes. And I think it's what people refer to as a little sugar. Well, if you hear nothing else, know that with your sugar level, it's an all or none game. It's either normal or it's not. And if it's not, then you have prediabetes or diabetes. Don't let those words scare you because if they scare you, then you don't have power over them and you can't take the steps that you need to do to improve your health. Um, we talked about family. A lot of times family has secrets and people don't talk about different things. It's important that you share your history with your family and that you share your struggles. Um, if no one knows that you have diabetes and they cook a meal and there's cakes and pies everywhere, then people may encourage you to eat things that you shouldn't. So again, if you let people know, then you can actually get support from your family and your network. And then if they know better, then you guys can do better as a group. Again, you heard people talk about your network that extends beyond your family. If everybody you know doesn't eat right, if they smoke, if they don't exercise, and if that's the company that you keep, then you too will do those things and you will predispose yourself to lifestyle illnesses such as diabetes and high blood pressure. So I just wanna emphasize that it may run in your family. It's not inevitable if you take the steps to prevent and prevention is a lot better than cure. But if you do progress, then know that there's a way to um, live healthy and to minimize or delay some of the side effects that occur with it. Um, talk about taking care of your mind, your body, and your soul. You can't take care of one without the other. And someone who has uh, a, a healthy mind and who takes time to do those mindful things can then put some energy into their health. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, just to continue on uh, these underlying conditions and these conditions that we see prevalent in the health, com uh, health com in the Black community, Dr. Rana, I would like to kick it back to you. You opened up giving us a wealth of context around the research and findings that you have conducted over the many years that you have been engaged in this work. So based off of your research and based off of your expertise and your intellectual knowledge, what do you think can be done to make health outcomes better for people with HIV and sickle cell disease? I, I think the biggest, I mean, biggest issues remain social issues uh, because of, you know, there are so many cross uh, sectional or intersecting stigmas uh, that affect people with HIV and they end up affecting people with sickle cell disease too. I mean, look at the things which are stigmatized in the society, race, gender, gender preference, poverty, uh, history of drug use, history of incarceration, obesity, uh, and so on and so forth. And all of them, all of those social determinants of health, they, they end up working through stigma. For example, poverty, you know, it, it, you have reduced access to care just because you may not be able to afford the medication. But there's even a bigger, bigger problem when people cannot call and make an appointment because they'll ask me about my insurance. They'll ask me about, oh, this is how much is deductible? Can you give us a credit card now? Uh, how, 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 would, how would I deal with those people? And if they have had one negative experience, you know, I, I, I have to say, none of us is immune. It, it just saddens me. Our own people, people, see, I consider myself black. You know, I've been, I've, I've lived in Pakistan for 20 some years and I've been at Harvard for, for 40 years. Uh, and then I was in Brooklyn. So I've lived more here. I consider myself black. I see our own people stigmatizing uh, other people with, with those conditions. So, for example, poverty, if you, if you are poor, you are much more likely to get those illnesses. But then again, uh, those illnesses would become you, make you poor too. Uh, and there is no bigger 
no bigger barrier to access to care than stigma. I think, uh, and many of these individuals then end up having mental health issues related to, to, to their situation. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the scheme of things, could you repeat that question, Dr. Blake? Uh, again, I, I, I may have gotten lost. Oh, not a problem, sir. What do you think could be done to make health outcomes better for people with HIV and sickle cell disease? Mm. I, I, I think two, three things can make a big difference and same thing can be applied for diabetes, hypertension uh, and mental illness. I, I think having a medical home uh, and some, some many people said before that having somebody in medical field who they can trust, who they can have lifelong relationship with. So to give you an example, I've been taking care of these children with HIV, many of them for 25, 27, 28 years, some even 30, 33 years. My oldest child is 33 years. And she was being repeatedly told, when are you going to find an adult care provider? And you know, here was somebody, I mean, she trusted me. Uh, she, had, she could tell me anything. She could trust me more than her grandma. And now she's being pushed to, because I'm a pediatrician, that I, 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 you must go out somewhere else. So uh, that aside, having a caring physician over a long period of time who you can trust, I think, and creating those situations, making it possible through funding that providing a medical home should be a priority for all chronic illnesses. I, I, I think that that's critical. Second thing is uh, financial aid. I think people who get disabled uh, because of HIV, sickle cell disease, mental illness, you name it, uh, their needs are tremendous. And when they start getting social security checks, they are not enough to live. Uh, these, these individuals, food stamps were taken away. These, these individuals are suffering badly uh, uh, and, and hurting uh, financially. So uh, th th there needs to be something that city uh, and other resources can do to support these individuals. Third thing, uh, and this is this is something I'm very passionate before uh, before I leave this world, is to have a center for social justice in healthcare, which would address these issues, which would have think tank at local, national, and international level uh, related to stigma, how stigma works, its drivers. Uh, local drivers and what, what are generalizable drivers, uh, so what are disease specific drivers and what are uh, common to different illnesses and indices and measure those uh, stigma indices in communities, especially faith community uh, to, 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 uh, to find ways to destigmatize. I think knowledge, knowledge is, is, is critical, but knowledge of what we can do to people uh, you know, just by moving your glass away from somebody uh, that, oh, you're afraid that they will give you something. That very, very small thing, how we ask questions about people's illnesses, how we make comments, how we, how, how we speak in, 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 uh, on the pulpit in front of uh, our, our parishes, it is so critical because somebody hearing a negative word uh, may never find the courage to come and talk to the priest or the or the pastor. So uh, we, we, we need to develop something called cultural sensitivity. We need to find a way to reflect on our own behavior, every single one of them. Every single one of us is responsible for stigmatizing others. Uh, yours truly included, but we need to become mindful of about uh, our, our own behavior, how we treat other people. I think within this COVID-19, there is a lot of stigma, a lot of isolation. And I tell people, you know, go out and volunteer. You know, find, make a difference. That is the most selfish thing you can do. Go out and find somebody to help. Even, the, you know, you, you see somebody struggling with tying their laces. You know, I did that. I found the opportunity to do this right, right in the lobby of the hospital. And there were 10 people looking at me and they were smiling. And, and, and this guy was right to give me a hug because he was having trouble tying his laces. So there are so many. Pick up the trash from the street. You know, uh, uh, do anything to make our community better. You will feel all that burst of oxytocin would make you feel 100 times better. 
God bless you all. Thank you. Dr. Rana, so I'm not in the medical field, but you're going to be proud of me because I know what oxytocin is. That is <laughs> the best, and that means that your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala and your hippocampus is all working together. So thank you for saying some terminology that I know. <laughs> um, I, awesome. Awesome. I want so to Dr. Blake. Yes. Um, can I jump in here? I, I you know, there's, there's, there's so much wonderful, you know, sharing going on, and I'm looking at the the chat, and um, I want to touch a little bit on some of the things that have come up in the chat with regards to uh, to drugs, to uh, food, to food deserts, to um, to cost of food, access to therapy, um, deinstitutionalization, destigmatization of mental health. These are these are huge issues that are functioning on societal, historical, generational levels that, mm -hmm. that no individual person is going to resolve during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of opportunities for us to make small decisions that can have an impact on us as individuals and the people who we interact with. The courses that we teach through Sky Schools are really constructed around this notion. We are not taught as Americans how to deal with stress. We're not taught how to resolve conflict. We're not taught to actually understand how to take care of our bodies, of our minds, how to utilize our breathing to be able to understand what's happening to us. And it's actually greatly disempowering. What we teach in our courses are these very fundamental skills for, for kids in particular in schools to learn, for, for teachers to learn, for parents to learn. This notion that if you learn about, so I'll give you just a simple example. Mm -hmm. When we feel angry, there is a corresponding rhythm to our breathing. When we feel happy, there's a rhythm in our breathing. When we feel anxious, there's a rhythm in our breathing. And what we teach in our courses, this, this, this very fundamental but profound transformational knowledge is that that is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. If you cultivate, master your breathing, you can also cultivate culture and master your emotions, your body, your mind. It's profound. Really, really, really simple. In your house, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. You know, you don't have to change much, but practice your breathing. Understand how something like breath, something like rest, even something as powerful as just closing your eyes putting your phone down and turning the TV off can radically transform your experience. Part of why people are so connected to drugs, alcohol is because those things are readily available. They're pushed on you. They're glamorized. They're advertised on television. And you're actually told that those are the ways to take care of yourself. That's how you're supposed to feel good. We're not taught other low cost high access tools like breathing, like stretching, like going for a walk. I think about how like when I was a kid, I would always like ridicule my parents. Like, what are we like walking for? What is this about? Like, you guys want to go for a walk as a family. Now I take my family on a walk. I realize the mental health implications of that. The other thing I think is really important, you know, there's been discussion of food, just attending to, to eating fresh -er food, eating light -er food, having one less soda, having one less cigarette, taking one longer walk, smoking one less joint. I mean, those are things that, that you know, I think sometimes when we look at these conversations, we, we engage in assuming that if we want to make a change, it's a wholesale change and it's today. It's actually about cultivating practice over time. We think about this pandemic, it's gone on for some time, it will go on for some time understanding that within this time, we're actually given a powerful opportunity to make some simple changes that can help us and actually partner with those around us 
to get those changes made. We offer through Sky Schools, we offer these healing conversations on Wednesdays. We offer these breathwork sessions on Tuesdays. We're partnered with uh, Fit DC, working with DC schools, doing, you know, uh, partnering with Aetna to be able to help people to get access to these tools that can profoundly transform our lives through simple, proven skills, which no one teaches us in school. I mean, it's amazing to think you go all through school. People don't teach this in school. You sit with your family. No one knows this black communities. You know, I'll just say this last thing before I pass the mic. Black communities are, are so attentive and so skillful in terms of cultivating joy, cultivating belonging and honoring people. Right. I mean, it's one of the beautiful legacies of being a black person, I believe. Um, one of the things we have to continue to cultivate within those traditions is histories of wellness. Dr. Everett spoke about this. Part of our legacy in the United States is poor food, unhealthy diet, making choices around, or, or sorry, having limited opportunities to, to expand our culinary practices, learning more about healthy cooking, learning more about, you know, like where we can get better food. These are, these are, these are socially limiting factors and the more that we can share knowledge with each other about the food around us and how to maximize its health benefit is really, really critical because people are correct. There are structural challenges to having access to healthy, clean food. And so making sure that we are sharing as much as we can, practicing as much as we can, and building community to support people in their decisions so that stigma is decreased, empowerment is is deepened and we all have better impacts long-term. Excellent, excellent. Hit it right on the nose. Uh, before we close out this piece, I would like to give every panelist an opportunity. I wanna give you one minute and 30 seconds, 90 seconds, right? So in 90 seconds, I want you to eat, focus on one of the three. Leave the audience with either a tip or strategy to focus either on one of the three. What can they do to either uh, improve their mental health, their physical health, or their social health? Give a strategy or a tip in 90 seconds that the audience could do to either improve their physical health, their mental health, or their social health. You could pick which one you wanna focus on. Mental, physical, emotional, one of those yeah. three. Yeah, okay. one of those three. You want me to start? Sure, kick it off. <laughs> okay, uh, and certainly, I, 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 as I said before, I think all of us need to mind our mental health. Um, uh, my uh, tip uh, would be, uh, first of all, uh, to know that DBH is here for you and the number that we put up on the screen, the 1887 We Help will allow you to access services and supports. I also wanna just quickly say that within our service delivery system, we uh, actually link with the faith community and other local organizations and other natural and trusted helpers in the community to provide services and supports to both everybody from the cradle to the grave. So seeing from little kids all the way up and we have uh, street outreach teams, our community response team is out there working with the homeless population. So remember, one eight eight seven we help and please do not uh, be afraid of calling that number and we will link you uh, and help you um, address your issue. Awesome. Next person is round 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 robin it out. I'll, I'll jump in and focus on the physical health with a reminder to know your family history, make a conscious decision to be healthier, do one healthier thing every day, surround yourself with positive people, and then leverage your health plan. My health plan certainly recognizes the value of mind, body, and soul. So there are different programs that actually impact that as well as we recognize that health is just not the clinical piece. So we in fact do things to impact the social determinants of health 
for the communities that our members live in. So certainly leverage the resources that your health plan has and just make sure that you um, educate yourself because knowledge is power. If you know better, you can do better. Dr. Mana? Yes, um, I take care of people with very serious illnesses like HIV, sickle cell, uh, and, and many mental health conditions uh, which end up affecting these individuals or their families. I, I think uh, one of the most critical thing uh, in staying healthy is medications. People with sickle cell disease benefit a lot from hydroxyurea and some of the other medications. It can really make a big difference. Uh, if they would take it. Unfortunately, 90% of adults with sickle cell disease are either not on hydroxy or they have stopped taking it many a time for, without any good reason. Uh, it is very safe. They should, they should give it a try. It would really change their life. People with HIV and, uh, and people with ADHD and other mental illnesses, please take your medication. Please make sure you go back and get your uh, viral load done and and for people with mental health condition please please uh, if you are having problem with your medications uh, please talk to your mental health care provider uh, to change there are a lot of new choices uh, where uh, medication or just lowering the dose uh, can can make a difference so taking your medications on time as prescribed it it really makes a difference. It, it, it can make you live a totally normal life. And if you need adjustment, please talk to doctor. Don't make those adjustments yourself. That's all I have to say. Uh, Mr. Weatherspoon. Okay, um, I got a ton of them, but, I, but for me, I would say, I'll share a couple of things. The first one is when you wake up in the morning, before you do anything else, drink a tall glass of water. Mm. I just sit down and drink a nice glass of lukewarm water and just relax for a minute before you pick up your phone, right? Just give yourself some time to just be with yourself. At the beginning of the session, um, I led us through a very simple exercise of just closing the eyes and paying attention to the different parts of the body. It's an exceedingly powerful practice, and you could do that, right? So sit comfortably, turn the TV off, and just start at your feet, and just go from your feet, different body parts, all the way to the top of your head, and then just bring your attention to your whole body. You can do it slowly. You can do it um, quickly. If you're having trouble sleeping, that practice also can be very, very... Um, effective in helping you relax. So you can do that both sitting up in a chair or laying down. And then connected to that, last thing I'll say, is breathe through your nose rather than your mouth. It's, very, it's like very simple, but as you move through your day, even if you just bring gentle attention to the quality of your breathing. Many of us don't even know we're breathing. Many of us don't even know we have a body. That's how in the mind we are. We're so caught up what's happening in work, happening in family, just gentle awareness, gentle cultivation of breathing through your nose and just being with what's happening can transform your whole experience. Thank you. So for my last question, um, I would like to take uh, some moderator privilege here. And I think I will be remiss if I don't ask this question specifically for the Black community that we have on the call here tonight. And Dr. Miles Everett, I would like to kick this question to you and you can start the, the, the response off. There is a major stigma, a major stigma right now around the COVID-19 vaccination process. Many of us, I was one of them, in the black community who had a fear of taking this vaccine. The research is telling us, the scientists are telling us, the media is telling us that the vaccine is safe. I will admit, I received my second dose on this past Saturday and now I'm happy, I'm happy to say so. But for those of us on the call today that still have that fear and still have that stigma, 
of taking the COVID-19 vaccination, what do you say to disrupt that narrative, especially in the Black community? Well, Dr. Blake, you showing that you actually had the vaccine and alive and well, I did it when I took my um, first and second, I posted it on Facebook to say, hey, people, look, I'm alive. COVID is real. I think most people who have any family or friends have been impacted by it. And I think they have to recognize that until more people are immunized, we will remain under house arrest and not be able to commune and enjoy the company of people that we love. So I think it's about, I, I, I honestly, I had fears at first too, but I educated myself. And you have to educate yourself with reputable sources. Anybody can put up a website, go to places like CDC, World Health Organization, talk to your trusted health professional, get the facts. And you know, people say, oh my gosh, they're gonna put a chip in me and follow me. I'm like, if you have a cell phone, they can follow you. <laughs> people say all kinds of things, you know, it, it impacts your fertility. They don't wanna put anything foreign, but these are people who smoke and drink. People have to recognize that it's life-saving and you're doing it not only for yourself, but the people that you love. We need community immunity. We need everybody to get vaccinated and tell others, bring them, take them, answer the questions and educate yourself and make a difference because each person makes a difference. Anyone else, feel free to jump in if you have something to add. I, I think what you just did, uh, I think we all need to do it uh, extensively. And when somebody speaks up, uh, whether it's within our family, in church, at any other place, uh, we should confront negative information right there. Uh, that just just say that's simply not true. You know, when that 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 is absolutely wrong. You know, uh, some something like that. That I'll show you something where you know this vaccine has been shown to be very safe. Just speaking up I, I alone makes a lot of difference. I think faith community can do a little bit more. Our priests and pastors and, and imams and mosques taking vaccination in front of everybody else, it would make a difference. I, I think we, we would have people always saying something negative, but I, 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 I think uh, every single one of us, every physician, every community leader has to do their part uh, to become an activist so that uh, we are all protected. And I, I feel, I mean, I, I totally agree uh, with what was said earlier, uh, but Dr. Miles Everett, and uh, we all uh, have uh, shared our experiences. I too have been uh, tested, I mean, have been, have received the vaccine. But the other thing that we have to do is be willing to have the conversation with people because this is a change process. This is a very serious decision. It is a personal health choice. And so it may mean that we have to have the conversation more than once. It can't be one and done. And if you don't do it, you're bad or what have you. We really have to listen and have to provide accurate information to people and have that conversation so that they move through that process of change so that they are ready to take the vaccine. And then when they are ready, have a clear pathway to do that. And so I think that it's not one and done. It can't be. We have to do all the things that you talked about in terms of uh, making sure that we are armed with accurate information because we also can't spread information that's not valid and accurate and, and in the science. And uh, and have the conversation. Yeah, you know, um, one of the big challenges around vaccination is is access, right? So you know, so if you look at the if you look at um, a lot of journalism right now, they're talking about you know, particularly for Black folks, there's been a there's been a slower pace of vaccination, people not knowing where to go. It's important that if you have you know good tech skills and you're good at you know, sort of navigating like places to sign up and seek information that you share it with members of the community who don't know how to navigate that or 
are having a hard time. One of my neighbors, 93 year old gentleman, members of our community are in the process right now of helping him get vaccinated. I got vaccinated. I took my first shot yesterday. I'm very excited about that. Um, encouraging people. I, I work in a school. I'm in contact with hundreds of people every day. I think it's really important to get vaccinated. I also really appreciate Dr. Bazaron, what it is you just said about, you know, talking to people. People do have real fear and stigma about getting vaccines, about, you know, going to the doctor, those, you know, you know, those things are real. I think a lot of members of the black community have either themselves or family members who refuse to go to the doctor, right? And so supporting people through that process and really helping them understand the importance of vaccination um, in the history of, of medicine. And, and I, you know, it's just coming to mind, thinking about the fact that it was an enslaved African in the United States who actually worked with George Washington, I believe, around inoculating the Continental Army and stopping a, an outbreak of smallpox, I think it was, during the Revolutionary War. So, you know, the history of inoculation is also deeply connected to African people. It's not a new thing. It's a, it's part of medical history. It's a part of um, who we are as a people living on this continent and sharing that information with people and helping them understand sort of the role that it's played is super important and being patient. Wow. Uh, round of applause. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, first, I want to give thanks to our audience tonight. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to really join and partake in this conversation. I think at the peak of the of the call, we had over 120 plus uh, people on the call tonight. So thank you all for your engagement. Even right now, we have 94. Um, that is awesome, definitely for in this late hour. Definitely want to thank our sponsors, um, Fit DC, Aetna, uh, Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Parks and Recreation. And most importantly, thank you for um, our esteemed mayor, Muriel Bowser, and the DC government for um, hosting this. But I want to give kudos to my fellow uh, colleagues here on the call tonight, Dr. Rana, Dr. Bezrone, Dr. Miles Everett, Dr. Miles Everett, and Mr. Weatherspoon. You all provided some intellectual knowledge. You all expanded our capacity around heart health, around diabetes, around sickle cell, around mental health, and around HIV. And it's my hope that we left um, a, 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 a great impact um, to our Black community tonight. And I hope that we have disrupted the narrative that we have access to mental health and physical health and social health resources that will allow us to thrive. So with that, just for some last words, I will kick it back to Mr. Duckworth, who is a part of Aetna. And thank you all for your engagement on this evening. Well, it actually went to me, um, uh, Jason. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, Jason. It's it's all good. Um, thank you, everybody that uh, was able to attend attendees. Those were some great questions. I know we tried to get to as many of them as we could. If you have a question and didn't get it answered or wanted to share something else, feel free to go to fitdc3.com. That is fitdc3. Dot com, and that will take you to this year's initiatives homepage. We have a section on it called Tell Us Your Story. You can quickly type into that, and we've got a bunch of different free, easy health and wellness resources that are specifically designed to guide us through COVID during these tough times and answer all of the under underlying conditions as well. So thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you, Susan, for pulling up the website. As you guys can see, just fitdc3.com. We focus on things that can help the body, help the mind, and help the community. So with that, uh, I'd like to wrap things up. Stay tuned for all the different information that's going to come out from all of the great places that you heard today. And if anything was plugged and you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, have a great uh, night. And again, happy Black History Month, everybody. Goodbye. Welcome to the Breathe With Me movement. Our mission is to nurture and sustain a community of care, compassion, and justice. We offer tools to heal from stress, trauma, and the violence of systemic oppression, racism, and injustice. My name is Joanne. Breathe with me. 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 Breathe with us. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. Breathe with me. 
breathe with me.